just All right, so it's one o'clock, oh. and I'm going to, you guys are going to pick up your conversation in a few sure. minutes, but um, I'd like to really welcome everybody who is here. We've got 85 folks who shared their location so far, anywhere from India to China to Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, California, New York. We've got both coasts represented, lots of places in between as well, so it's really wonderful to see everyone here. I really want to say thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Matia Marquardt. I'm the director of the online campus here at Columbia School of Social Work. And we're going to do just a very quick um, intro to Adobe Connect in case there's anyone here who hasn't used it before. So I'm going to just walk you through a few steps. All right, so welcome. If you're on Google Chrome, you might have issues, so um, I would just recommend logging out and logging right back in um, on a different browser if you run into anything. Um, when we say log out, it just means close your browser, which you can do however you would normally close your browser. And we really encourage you to chat this whole time. Some people worry that we're going to think it's rude if you chat, but we love it. We want to hear your comments and um, just see what you're thinking. And um, So please chat as much as you like and chat with each other and chat with us. If chatting um, is too small for you, you can actually change the font size. So you can make it larger by going to this menu in the upper right here of the chat. And you can change it to whatever size you like. And we'll be asking some polls. And the way that you respond to them is either you just type into the box and then click Submit, or um, click on a circle or a square. And you'll know that you responded because either um, either you'll see the answer is submitted, or you'll see something, uh, there'll be a reaction if you're clicking on a circle or a square. And I'd just like to say, you know, here we are talking online uh, post-election about policy and politics and advocacy. Um, it might be tempting to type your first reaction to the chat, but I want to encourage us all to be respectful of everyone here who might have different opinions and come from different perspectives. Um, let's have a very civil online conversation because we're, um, we're lucky to have this chance to come together and to learn from each other. So with that, I'd like to um, welcome up Mary Leah Coxawanahara, who's our Director of Marketing Communications, and she'll be introducing Nick. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Mary Leah Cox Iwanohara. I direct marketing and communications for Columbia University School of Social Work. And I have to make a confession. I'm not a social worker. But the best part of my job is getting to meet students and graduates of our program who do amazing things with their MSWs. The Master's in Social Work is an extremely versatile degree, and you can go in so many directions with it. And I started this online event series in March of this year because I thought we need to share the stories of some of our students and graduates with a wider audience. They deserve a wider audience, and I'm glad you're all here today. Today's featured guest is Nick Beitu, and he's a great example of what I'm talking about. Um, welcome, Nick. <laughs> I think he's coming on. Um, and. We actually had a meeting. Hi, Nick. You're, you are there. OK. Um, and Nick is actually, I was going to say, he's still a student at our school. He's a second year student. He'll be graduating in 2017, May of. And um, Nick, you've just gotten through a week of finals. Have you recovered yet? Yes. I, I'm still trying to get rid of the bags under my eyes. But <laughs> I'm finally on this well, side have, of it. You have youth, so that helps, I think. Um, <laughs> So um, our, our school had a meeting the day after the election, on November 9th. And on that day, Nick really impressed me with what he had to say to us. And I think maybe the best way of introducing you, Nick, is to play a little video we made of you a few days after that. Would that be OK? Sure. My parents came here from Iran, uh, and during the, during like the, the late 1970s, early 80s, and that was when uh, the Iran hostage crisis was taking place, and there were signs on doors saying, "No dogs or Iranians allowed." And so, for them to eventually come to a place like Orange County during times like those was 
difficult. And they often sort of hide from the difficulty of that or try to shield me from that. But the, the frequent anti-immigrant uh, sentiment that tends to show up in, in places like that, it creates sort of a, an air of hostility towards folks who come here in search of a better life. For, for other folks, uh, members of the LGBTQ community like myself, uh, a place, a, a place like that can also be a bit overwhelming because of the very vocal proclamations of a strong religious contingent. Now that I have the skills and resources from a program like this one, um, and with the experience, and with the sort of accumulation of experiences and observations that I've had in my own life, I have been able to sort of convert fear and anger to action and to activism and to advocacy. And it is my responsibility to take what I've learned in order to empower folks, to empower communities, and um, to empower systems that will fight against oppression, that will um, preserve rights, and that will uh, allow, allow individuals and communities that have been historically disenfranchised to uh, achieve the quality of life that they deserve. It's up to us to find that empathy so that folks can be heard on both sides, so that the folks were I think the way the political climate is shifting, it seems that now more than ever there is a need for more social workers out there, and there's a need for more individuals who are committed to understanding oppression and understanding systems and understanding communities and individuals and how these all work together um, to affect quality of life outcomes for different folks. Students of color, disabled or undocumented, people who hold any marginalized identity or under attack, it is our duty to protect the rights of the clients we serve. And I feel that the more backgrounds come, the more voices are more represented, the more faces that we see, the more national origins that are represented here, the more languages that are spoken here, the more we all learn um, and the more we all benefit and the more uh, knowledge we all acquire and how to work with different people and how to empower different people and how ourselves to become better people. So, to folks who are interested in applying, I would say, do it. You have something to offer. You have something that we need. We want you to be here. Well, that, that was a powerful and moving video. Um, as the creator of the online event series, I get to start us off by asking a few questions of Nick. I'm waiting for him to come back on camera. There he is. There you are. I keep losing you. I know. Um, so I get to start us off by asking a few questions from my non-specialist perspective before we hand it off to Professor John Robertson, who's an expert on advocacy. And my first question to you, Nick, is um, I know you were upset. I witnessed you how upset you were in the immediate wake of the election. But have you changed anything in your daily life since then? Have you tried to understand opposing points of view? Have you donated to a group, contacted a member of Congress, or anything like that? Sure. It's been, I guess, in one way, I've had to learn how to manage new levels of ambient stress. Um, but in addition to that, I find that uh, my, my inner activist has really emerged um, through this process and or through, through all the changes that have taken place. And I find that um, I've been participating in protests. I've been finding opportunities to, uh, to share my voice and to, and to be out there and to uh, bring visibility to dissent or to bring visibility to the reasons for dissent. Um, I, take a lot of, uh, I take a lot of leads and I take a lot of cues from from the uh, from movements for LGBT rights, I find a lot of um, cues in movements for um, the rights of different racial groups or the different um, for groups of uh, different immigration statuses. Um, in particular, I think the uh, one that I've been looking to a lot has been the movement uh, from the water protectors um, along the Dakota Access Pipeline about demonstration, about bringing information, about bringing um, visibility to an issue that is either overlooked or is um, you know feeling feeling oppressed from uh, from these different things, and I've been uh, in the process of creating my own organization or uh, creating my own uh, of organizing on behalf of uh, a few direct actions that I've been considering as well. 
Oh. Well, you have been busy. Um, and, and, and another question I have is, is, I know you're studying clinical social work, which is true of a majority of students at our school, but it strikes me that in times of political change, that most, even people who are working as therapists, social workers who are working as therapists, they have to put on a policy hat. Would you mm -hmm. say that's right? Or uh, I think it's an interesting question because it, um, it kind of uh, points to this, this impression that the folks making change are folks who are out on the streets or that the folks making change are the ones who are writing laws. But um, I think uh, because social work is a field that's a very diverse one, it's a very multifaceted one, it's a, and it's a very versatile one, um, it tends to overlap with a lot of different disciplines, but what brings social work to these places or to these intersecting places is um, this grounding in social justice, this um, rearing in um, advocacy and this, uh, this capacity towards change making. And I think that mm -hmm. clinical social workers, we, we are uniquely positioned to be face to face with clients, to see clients one on one, and we get to see, mm -hmm. um, we get to hear from them what what issues are affecting them and we get begin to sort of um, see patterns emerging and what is what sorts of issues are affecting groups of people who is showing up and why and alternatively who isn't showing up and what what barriers are there to treatment what um, what deters folks from receiving services uh, we access research and we see in research who is represented and um, where research can be improved but we also see where groups and communities aren't uh, represented in research. I think about the LGBT population again and how we um, often are burned or we feel that uh, mental health um, or even like any kind of health care is inaccessible because folks, perhaps even um, well-intentioned folks, aren't quite prepared or don't um, understand the nuances of our experiences. So it's important to sort of add to that canon of research. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged by the idea that, or by the statistics that the majority of healthcare professionals are now social workers, and that really yes. um, speaks to our capacity to build change in movements. Well, I think that's true, and that's that's really something that, that differentiates the social work field from, say, psychology. Mm -hmm. I think that you have that, that policy dimension to it. Also, finally, I just wanted to say I really like the part of the video where you say the more backgrounds you have at social work school, the more you learn to work with different people and empower them. Mm -hmm. And as we know, we now live in a divided America. Would your vision of diversity and multiculturalism include economic diversity, ideological diversity? I'm just yeah. curious. I know that's the question of the moment in the press. So, Absolutely. Um, I think the it sort of speaks to this idea of um, humanization or humanizing. And um, a sort of a, a tenet that has really stuck with me from my beginning here is that social work as a discipline strives to marry um, the art of the relationship with the science of change. And I think about how we as social workers are uniquely positioned to create relationships that will build visibility, create empathy, and lead towards change. And the more mm -hmm. we learn about each other, the more we're able to learn um, access points and entry points to begin doing that. That's good. Well, thank you both. And at this point, I'd like to welcome up Professor John Robertson, who will be talking us through a little bit of um, how policy and advocacy work in social work. Thank you, Professor Robertson. Hi. So I've, I've been teaching advocacy at the school for many years. And I'm, uh, what I'm going to do right now is thanks to another person who taught uh, advocacy, Michael Friedman who is a, a, a major worker in mental health policy, uh, really around the country, but certainly in the state of New York. And he always points out that there are Republican de uh, administrations and Democratic administrations, and we need social workers who can be take leading roles in both. So we really need a diverse profession. Um, so uh, I want to start by talking about um, who, what, how we speak out and who speaks out. Uh, really, we all do. And when the democracy is really working, everyone is finding a way to make their voices be heard. People directly affected, concerned citizens, service providers, professionals, we all have a, have a role in making this uh, 
our voice is heard. And one of the particular roles that social workers have is to support and, and encourage uh, people in the community and people whose lives are most directly affected to have their voices heard in the, in the, in the national discussion. This is a slide about Bar Senator Barbara McCloskey, who is a social worker, and her work on the Social Work Reinvestment Act. She's just retiring now. She has been head of the uh, Budget Committee in the Senate for the uh, in the or or the ranking minority leader for the last while. Um, so in social work, we talk about uh, a, a generic social work uh, method, assessment, planning, and action. And, and so the, we start by saying, what is the problem? What are we thinking about? What do we care about? And I think every social worker has to get their feet underneath them, find out what really matters to them. And it, the whole world matters, but what is it that is mine to do? Uh, we're going to see in a minute, uh, think globally and act, uh, and act uh, uh, locally. We all have the thing that is ours to do. What do we need? What is it? Is it um, immigration uh, concerns? Is it things around the needs of child, kids in the child welfare system? Is it people that are coming out of prison? Where is our work to do? And then for an advocacy planning, we need specific goals. We want to see this happen. We want to see that there is a process for people who are born, who were raised here to be able to stay in the country and be part of the country. We want to see how it is that someone who's coming out of prison can have a place to put their feet, to sleep, to find a way to work, setting, setting goals and being specific. And then the next part is how do we strategically think about this? Who is it who has the power to make a difference? How do we get access to them? Uh, is this a legislative issue? Is this an issue for uh, the administration? Is it, is it an issue that needs to be raised much more in the community? Uh, how do we identify a strategy and, and think about how to move forward? And even if you're taking an issue like prison reentry, you know, somebody might be working on employment and somebody might be working on housing, they're both really important. It requires specific and hard work on both issues. It, it doesn't happen in a general way, and that's one of the amazing things about social work, is it doesn't happen in a general way. And then that leads us to taking action. And action is the lifeblood of our work. It gives us a sense of our purpose. It moves us from inertia and uh, to a place of satisfaction. So we can see here uh, a little bit more on agenda setting, strategy, and tactics. Um, how do we move? How do we lobby? Are we involved in public education, in demonstrations, in legal action, in direct action? On any topic, there may be a place for all of those. And that's part of what it takes. It, and usually it takes that we find some people who are willing to work with us, uh, who are already working in it. Um, but the really specific thing that social workers have is we have direct on the ground experience and bringing that experience to the debate, bringing those, those views to the debate, standing up for what we know will work and standing against things that we're concerned will not work or will take us in another direction. That is exactly what it is that we bring to this. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Um, I hope you're registered to vote. I, I encourage you to join a group that's working on something that you care about, make financial contributions, get involved in their public uh, development of ideas, and take a leadership role. Um, so that's a beginning thinking about advocacy in the, from the social work profession. So I think I'm inviting Nick back on, and we're going to uh, uh, continue this conversation. So Nick, how are, we're, we're moving ahead with these, and we're going to start with a poll in a minute. But um, uh, how, how, is, how is thinking about this advocacy agenda uh, worked for you in your social work education? It's, it's been really uh, a powerful way to sort of take feelings or like perhaps take what might be a, a purely emotional experience or really raw emotional experience and channel that uh, constructively towards action. Uh, it sort of builds a blueprint or it builds, it 
kind of builds a model through which um, I feel like I can go from just react, like reacting emotionally to reacting through action. And I think that's, that's been really helpful in sort of um, helping me, helping me transition from what should I do to here are the steps I need to, to take in order to accomplish change. So we have a poll up and everybody's invited, please, to type your answer. Uh, what would you like to change if you were planning for action change? We have somebody who's written change the electoral college system, somebody who's written bullying, um, somebody's written the massive overhaul of the criminal justice system, um, uh, LGBT stigma, uh, raise the age in New York. Um, many thoughts are coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. and. Um, so if we're going to talk about change, what, are, what, what, topic, what topic are you thinking about today, Nick, in terms of something to bring about change? I find myself looking a lot at uh, the reproductive rights issues. I see LGBT stigma. I see anti-Islam sentiments. Like those are, those are ones that are really standing out for me. So I had a discussion in class last week about reproductive rights, and students were saying that maybe this is the time to develop a very wide public education campaign to help women understand the power and the choice they have in, in fertility uh, mm -hmm. and in birth control, and that in the midst of uh, what's going to be a, a, a noisy and often confusing debate about, uh, about reproductive rights, um, this is a time when social workers have direct contact with a lot of people, and can we get a conversation going that increases empowerment? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so we're grateful for all of this. Are we ready for the next poll? So um, what do you think is stopping us from taking action? What's stopping you, Nick, from taking action? What gets in the way? Uh, sometimes it's an idea of, or sort of like perhaps it's a lack of clear idea of what I want uh, the end result to be, or sometimes it's this idea that sometimes I sort of um, devalue my, my the, the power of the individual. I think what, what is something that I as one person can do? And I think that sometimes, that in the past has really stopped me from from moving forward or for or from um, building coalitions or from even just taking the first steps towards making change happen. Yeah, somebody wrote, don't want to ruffle feathers. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, how to affect change, fear of violent backlash. Um, so mm -hmm. each of these are, are really valid um, experiences that we all have about what keeps us from having our voice heard. Uh, but on the other hand, it is in naming and seeing what our resistance is and, mm -hmm. and then finding some people to work with to move through that, finding the particular role that I can have in that. I know that there's major discussion about sanctuary cities going on, and one of the things that we're doing in my local community right now is talking to both our assemblyman and our state senator about what the position they're going to take in this debate, because it's, mm -hmm. they're going to be central in how New York reacts to whatever, uh, however we land on the sanctuary city issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it, getting, finding the phone number, making the calls, feeling like maybe I won't get heard, all of those things become what, things that limit us from effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I've identified or I've noticed is that because there are so many people who who carry both of these sentiments, this this idea of I'm so outraged or I wish there was something to do and the I'm just one person, uh, what, what can I do? Or like, uh, I, I don't feel like I have the power to do something. There's great, um, there's been some very beautiful solidarity emerging in this sort of in response to what's been happening. And I've noticed that the more, the more movement is seen, the more outrage is seen, or the more, the more people have been um, making bringing visibility to their circumstances, the more momentum is built. And so one thing I would uh, sort of put forward that has been helpful for me is to put yourself out there or to identify the, or to uh, just search for the people who are doing the same because nobody is alone in this. And there is power, there is great power in um, identifying what's at stake. And uh, because doing so will bring momentum, will bring movement, will bring, um, numbers and through those numbers that's how we begin the process of bringing power to that change or bringing potential to that change yeah thanks nick i think we're probably ready for the next poll um 
Um, so who is, in the world are your role models, the people who have been effective uh, and active in the world when, when it wasn't safe? Um, so Nick, your name came up immediately. Um, my, myself, um, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Gates is here. Gandhi, Marion Wright Edelman. Um, Malala, I see Malala. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, absolutely. So we're never really on our own. This is already happening all around us. It's like, do we? St it's one of the most important choices in life is who we decide to put ourselves beside and who we decide to make our compatriot so that we can move ahead. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I have people in the neighborhood, people in the in in my church, people in the in the in at Columbia, people in various group movements who are mm -hmm. who push me. I hear from them. They hear from me. It moves us forward. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this uh, this sort of amalgamation of of role models is that I'm seeing Gandhi, I'm seeing uh, Black Lives Matter, I'm seeing Malcolm X, I'm seeing Rosa Parks, I'm seeing a people who who have put themselves out there. Where I see people who have made change in different ways. There's some folks who did it through policy. There's some folks who did it on a very um, small level by refusing to participate in in an oppressive practice. There are people who um, have organized. I think um, somebody before has mentioned Ellen DeGeneres as an example, and that's somebody who has made change happen through comedy. And the idea is that there's no one way to do it, and that all of these methods and all of these access points are entirely necessary. And I want to emphasize this because there's there's something to be said that everybody has that everybody has a role in this, and everybody has something within them that that will make change happen or that can bring. Um, attention to to a movement and uh, I would encourage folks to find what it is within them that uh, can make change happen or find out what their what their access points are I just have one brief story about a woman who lives on my block who started by putting pictures of her hero in her living room windows and mm -hmm. people stopped by and then she started working out on the street and she's become a leader on our local block association fighting for safety and fighting for inclusion. And mm. now she's a major voice in the neighborhood working for affordable housing. And it's just one step and then another step and meeting people and being connected. And so she's quite an astounding role model in our little world here in the corner of Bushwick where I live. I wish I could see that for myself. <laughs> yeah, well, come and see. She'll be glad to fix you coffee. So are we ready for the next poll? Sure. So the question is, what's your next step? How mm -hmm. do we move forward? Uh, what am I thinking I'm going to do more of? So um, doing this uh, webinar was definitely a next step for me. I, it came out of nowhere, and it's like, OK, let's start talking together about this. And the other next step I'm having is I'm, I'm working with a group of people that are teaching advocacy in the spring, and we're looking forward to the inauguration happening, to um, some executive orders about immigration happening, to an announcement about a Supreme Court justice happening, um, mm -hmm. to decisions being made about the, uh, the federal budget. Uh, decisions being made about deportation, and mm -hmm. how do we all keep our feet on the ground? How do we keep ourselves centered and stay focused on what matters to us most and, mm -hmm. and continue to act, not be sort of overwhelmed by the, the flow of the times? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, um, on my end, uh, something a project that I've been uh, sort of working on is one, to sort of build a blogging collective of folks who kind of uh, merge all these different disciplines and all these different um, passion projects to sort of address this idea of fake news or this idea of people being heavily misinformed. Um, the idea is to bring knowledge uh, to issues and to use that knowledge uh, from a social work or from a social justice standpoint uh, to bring action and to encourage people to understand um, the different um, the different layers and nuances involved in each of these issues and to use the to empower people through knowledge because I think um, once people have knowledge there's power in that and with that power we can build momentum for change um, the more people know and it's a sort of a way of um, leveraging our our privileged uh, access to information through being an institution or through uh, being able to access research and to bring that to people who don't have that same um, privilege of access or that privilege of information mm -hmm. yeah 
So I, I think I think um, building our education, building our knowledge is a really important step in this, but it has to move into a stage where three or four people are sitting around at a table and saying, what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. Who are we going to talk to? What is the issue we're going to pursue? How are we going to move ourselves into standing up for um, uh, 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 there's a lot of concern about uh, the DACA kids in our in our school. I'm teaching a number of people with DACA situations, mm -hmm. and there there's a lot of fear about that. How how are we going to support them? How are we going to ask the country to understand and include them? Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to help uh, and support people as they stand up and speak for themselves? Where are the forums? Are the forums local? Are they in state legislatures and city halls? And they certainly will be in the debates that are going to be happening in Washington. Mm -hmm. And this is an issue that's clear that there's many points of view on it, but it is not resolved. There's yeah. a whole bunch of, uh, of, of energy and um, uh, President-elect Trump himself has said that at the moment he's thinking about people that have broken laws. He's not thinking about people that haven't. And mm -hmm. so he's, he's open to having the discussion as well. So how mm -hmm. do we bring our voices to this discussion? And, and are we willing to do that? Um, mm -hmm. But this DACA is just one thing. You could be equally be talking about the water keepers, um, which mm -hmm. is another place where this is going to be happening. Yeah. And I think um, with the with the topic of undocumented residents or undocumented Americans, it's an especially it's it's an especially relevant place uh, in which social workers can leverage things like privilege or can really support um, and bring empathy for a group that often feels very vulnerable to to public sight or feels vulnerable to making themselves known or making themselves visible for very understandable reasons. And I think that that's that's all the more reason that we can leverage things like visibility, things like information, things like empathy building to really bring information, really bring, um, uh, really bring solution and really bring uh, humanity to a group that is um, unnecessarily or needlessly stigmatized or a group that is misunderstood. Um, we can bring that humanization to that group. And I think that that becomes a great starting point for um, making change happen and building uh, collaborations and building movement on their behalf. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing a number of people writing in the chat that they're thinking about or applying for MSWs, and the day after you hit the send button, start as a social worker. So mm -hmm. go find some place where people are, uh, where your time and energy will be of value. Start a conversation there, hear what people are asking about, find out how you can be useful. And, mm -hmm. and then participate with them in building their voice because you don't have to wait till you get to walk in the door of the school. You mm -hmm. can begin tomorrow, the day after you hit the send button on your application, uh, to begin to act into this truth. Mm -hmm. Matias with us. <laughs> yes, I'm here to be the voice of the chat folks um, as they ask questions. So I'm going to pose questions to you. And um, a, cu a couple people raised a question a while back in the chat. Um, Sophie and Rich both raised that they, since the election, they've been trying to volunteer. They've been calling organizations, women's organizations or civil rights organizations, trying to volunteer, but they can't get a live person or they're not getting calls back. How, mm -hmm. how would you handle that kind of a situation? Yeah. Um, vo volunteering is, is actually an art in itself. And um, most of the organizations in the last month and a half have been just overwhelmed both with internal and external stimuli. And, um, and so I, I, one thing you might want to do is to go on their website and find something they're doing and just join them in it. Uh, go and join what they're doing directly if it's an organization that you really feel a deep identification with it. Mm -hmm. Another thing you might do is you might pull together some people in your local setting, whether it's in college or in on your job or in your neighborhood, and have a conversation about how together you all want to have some impact on this. Mm -hmm. And then um, having done that, you can take that to the uh, the organization you're having contact with. 
Um, so those are two things. Then there's just the you know staying on the phone uh, and uh, calling at off times until you get through to somebody and start having a conversation. But I think right at the moment, overwhelmed has been the characteristic, and everybody actually acting, moving in the direction of action, um, is is really uh, is, is it makes us all feel stronger. It makes us all feel like clearer, and you'll find the connections you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Professor Robertson, there's actually a something that we like in a previous in a previous discussion we've had. Um, I really want to emphasize the the second point about um, doing uh, creating action on your own. If you're not able to connect to other folks who are doing that, there's this <clears throat> this act of uh, identifying five people who would be relevant or five people who have stakes in the change that you would like to make and bringing them together. Um, with the purpose of one, identifying what that change is, and two, using that group of five relevant people to identify five relevant people each. And in doing so, you you create this movement of people, you create this network of contact points, you create this network of change makers, you connect this network of people who are interested in and capable of creating the change that you want to make. And that way you can sort of build momentum on a project and then bring people in as you go on. I said earlier. I said earlier that on uh, on November the 9th, everybody woke up surprised. Uh, I had several students in my class who were very happy with the outcome, but they were hugely surprised. And so I think we're all figuring out. All the organizations are figuring out this. But yes, I agree with you, Nick. It's really moving ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have one question from Victoria who asks, is there a progressive social justice focused um, social work association besides NASW? Hmm. And this is uh, for the folks in the chat as well. If you know of a, um, a social work organization that's I, 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 there is, but I, but I, the, it's an alphabet soup, and I'm not being able to capture it. It used to be the Bertha Cape and Reynolds Association, and there is a gathering of um, of social workers that function at at local and national levels. But the the truth is, the most useful thing is to create a chapter. You know, mm -hmm. just pull together a group of you and start thinking about it because organizing will require that. Mm -hmm. And um, and and so uh, I, I, if somebody can pull that up, I can't do the Google search right now. Um, I, or if you if you send me an email separately at jgr six at columbia edu, I'll get it for you. Mm -hmm. But um, and while we're looking that one up, there's one that I've encountered called uh, the Undoing Racism Internship Project. Uh, we just call it Europe. It's U-R-I-P. Um, and their mission is to collaborate with social workers. And um, I, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if it's a national organization or if it's just a local one. But the, the goal is to identify how, uh, through the internship process, um, social workers or social work interns are both capable of, uh, and are capable of both uh, perpetuating and resolving oppression through their practices, through what they bring to these opportunities. And it's a great way to sort of help us understand how to help us as um, burgeoning social workers to understand how we um, are agents in oppression and agents against oppression. Uh, and I think it's a way, great way to understand ourselves in both of these uh, in both these facets of ourselves. We have a definition question from Tatiana who asks, "Can you define the difference between advocacy, activism, and abolition work? Abolition mm. work." Oh, it's an interesting set. Uh, mm -hmm. I would. I would venture to say that advocacy is um, is sort of to go back to the example of undocumented residents is to sort of identify the need to work with to work with groups to identify their needs and to speak on their behalf or to use to use our positions of privilege in ways uh, to support folks who don't have access to those same privileges um, to put ourselves out there on behalf of vulnerable folks who perhaps don't know where to don't have access to the same platforms we do. Whereas activism, I would say, is perhaps the process of doing that, is perhaps the process of bringing visibility, is the uh, process of um, making change happen. And abolition, this is, I would guess, I would venture to say it's the idea of doing away with, with oppressive practices altogether. For example, um, removing the Defense of Marriage Act or putting same sex, uh, putting same gender equality into, into legal canon. I, uh, um, we talk about advocacy as being assessment, what's happening here, planning, how do we proceed, and action. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
to get involved in activism means that you already have assessed and planned. You've already mm -hmm. figured out what needs to happen and how you're going to do it. And so you can t attach yourself to somebody else's action that you're really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with what Nick was saying about uh, the term abolition. It, it, it's specifically about something. And a lot of advocacy is about improving or reforming or calling for something new. It's not, it's not necessarily calling to end something. Mm -hmm. uh, like creating a family daycare, which a lot mm -hmm. of people are working really hard on right now. Yeah. Family leave and family daycare. So it looks like Crystal has found for us that um, the Bertha Cape and Reynolds Association is now the Social Welfare Action Alliance. Right. So thank Thanks, you, Crystal. Crystal. Mm -hmm. mm. And we've got a question from Renee that's been seconded by a few folks. Um, so what do you do if there's an issue that's incredibly important to you but also really personal? Um, and in order to take action, you sort of feel like you have to disclose your personal experience, but you don't want to have a stigma attached to you professionally, especially if you're early in your career. Mm. I think that's, that's a particularly tough one. I think about, um, it reminds me of the, the, the work of an organization called ACT UP. And I'm trying to remember what the, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty long acronym, but the idea is that it's in, uh, it's at an empowerment group for folks living with HIV or uh, with AIDS, and this emerged like in the 70s in response to a lack of um, a lack of attention and a, and a great deal of stigma and a lack of information about um, this particular population. And um, the the mission of this group is to bring empowerment and to bring change and to bring um, a humanity to a group that was often very ignored or overlooked or stigmatized in very heavy ways. And through them, there was a great deal of social change that was able to happen. Um, and so that's, that's sort of an example of something I would point to in terms of like who has put themselves out there and what has that work done. Um, the result is that we have a great deal of medical, the like increased medical attention to folks uh, living with that, with this condition. Uh, we have a destigmatization of folks, but it involves, it involves some folks being willing to put themselves out there and involved one-on-one, um, one-on-one uh, one -on -one empathy building to change minds at like the individual and family level. It involved um, advocacy on sort of a, a larger scale to bring social change. It involved uh, legal changes. It was a multifaceted process and it involved, yeah, you know, some people putting themselves out there. It involved an increase of visibility. Um, it's something that had to happen with the end goal in mind. Um, and so that's, I would, I would point uh, folks in the direction of ACT UP. Uh, as a place to sort of look for uh, for clues or for hints or for suggestions about where to begin, something like that. Well, that whole movement, um, because you had people working for GMHC, uh, you had people who were working for uh, for ACT UP, and then you had people who are working deep in parts of hospital systems and government systems at a time when there was quite a lot of hostility towards uh, LGBT folks. Mm -hmm. And so not everybody made the same choice about public disclosure. Uh, they could do, effect, people did effective work without it. Mm -hmm. The thing I would say is start with yourself, put a lot of support around yourself, get yourself good supervision, talk through what it is you care about and how you're going to proceed. Don't, don't uh, get too far ahead of the fact that you're, the, that you're going to make all the differences in the world, um, that you know, we're, we're all acting. And don't, um, don't feel like you're compelled to do anything you're not comfortable with. Do what you can be comfortable with, that you can live with, that you can support. Um, and putting a community of support around you, you'll find a way to raise the issues and also to maintain your own integrity, your own, uh, and, and look after yourself, I think. Um, mm -hmm. If you, you know, if you want to be more specific, call me or call another, uh, somebody who's done some supervision in this area and, and start a conversation. Mm -hmm. Right, and I see someone um, was sharing that they have a monthly dinner with social workers, which is a great idea. Very good so idea. Kind of, yeah. yeah, it was Russell It has quarterly dinners with Columbia alumni and a few other social work friends. Good for self-care, but they always end up talking about issues and advocacy. I mean, that's what I, happens I've, when social workers get together. 
I, I think that to have a monthly dinner or a monthly breakfast with people that care about what you care about, um, it, you, you come away feeling like you're not alone. You come away feeling like the battle isn't hopeless. You come away feeling with new ideas and new steps to take. Strongly mm -hmm. recommend that kind of building of community of support. Mm -hmm. So we have a tough question from Kim who asks, um, how do you make the decision whether to go micro or macro? I think it, it speaks to a lot of what Professor Robertson was saying, and that is the, the idea of knowing yourself and knowing what your, knowing what your, knowing what your role is, or no, not, not knowing what your role is, but knowing what, you're, knowing what you're comfortable with and knowing what it is that you want to make happen. Um, to understand that you need to take care of yourself and to understand that you need to um, be able to uh, advocate for yourself and sometimes advocating for yourself knows knowing when to stop or knowing, uh, knowing which uh, circumstances or which areas you can't quite um, function in without like uh, feeling like you're being attacked. So I think the idea is if you're comfortable with micro work, if you're comfortable with um, speaking individually with folks and if you're comfortable with um, perhaps uh, building empathy or humanity for an issue with uh, your friends, with your family, with um, coworkers, that's a place that needs that work. And if you're comfortable uh, putting yourself out there and being visible and uh, making, you know, uh, taking your voice to uh, a broader scale, that work is needed to be done as well. But the idea is to understand what needs to be done and understand what it is that you're good at and what your skills are um, and to using and using those skills in those spaces that uh, that you know you can accomplish these things or that uh, you can identify our places in which you're comfortable and which you're able to make these changes happen. Yeah, I, I say to my clinical social work friends, you know, you, the folks you're talking to have issues that need you and them to speak about. And I speak, talk to my uh, social work administrator and policy friends by saying that on Wednesday night you need to go run a group with some people and really hear what folks on the ground are saying and you need to do that every Wednesday night for the rest of your work life. Mm -hmm. Because this, the, the, it, it, all of us are working on uh, advancing issues of a group of clients and, and a group of people that need our services and we may be part of that group. Um, we need to stay rooted there, but we also need to continue to be part of the movement to uh, to build a, a world that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. So we have a question for Nick. Can you say more about what Middle Eastern Americans are doing to advocate them for themselves? And I'll put up this picture of you with your caucus. <laughs> um. Well, as a Middle Eastern American uh, who's hoping to advocate for himself, one of the one of the ways that I've actually um, been trying to leverage my position and my leverage and leverage my access to to information is to create is to create it's to sort of further the knowledge of what uh, the Middle Eastern American experience has been. And I remember a a paper I wrote for one of my classes was to sort of identify and bring and illuminate the experiences of Middle Eastern American. Uh, individuals who also identified as members of the LGBT community. And what I discovered was that there's very, very little research on this particular field. Um, and so that's one way that uh, I've decided to dedicate a portion of my career to doing uh, is to is to conduct research and to um, create resources for folks who uh, who share this identity so they can uh, be normalized, so they so they can feel like they're normalized, so they can feel less isolated and they can feel heard and feel that they, they have a place in this world, uh, and uh, considering that these are identities that are often in competition with each other or that exist in places that stigmatize against both of them. Uh, and the flip side is to uh, empower other folks who are searching to support uh, groups like this or to empower others who might encounter um, people like us who carry these identities um, so, that they can, so that they can be prepared to serve us, so that they can prepare, be prepared to work with us, so they, they can be, pre be prepared to um, meet us in a way that's respectful and humanizing and necessary to where we are at those times. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a, um, a combo question here that's come up from a different, a few different people. So um, I'll, I'll give you the three questions and then um, you can see how you want to respond to them. So one question is, um, to be a social worker, do you have to be a liberal on all topics? 
And then another question that's sort of related is, how can we bridge the two sides mentality, sort of the Democrat versus Republican or liberal mm -hmm. versus conservative? And then finally, how can we focus our advocacy and activism in an inclusive way that includes different perspectives from both sides of the aisle? So if I were to start, I would say, put yourself with some people you're serving. You know, um, this is not an ideological discussion. It's about who who do you care about. And um, if you're working with uh, with with rural um, uh, uh, unemployed folks, you're going to find yourself engaging with a point of view that comes from there. If you're going to be working with people who who are feeling um, uh, that their lives have been interrupted by American criminal justice policy. You're going to find yourself ending up there. If you're working with people who've been victims of violent crime, you're going to want, find yourself working there. Um, and so uh, the, the, the action of finding yourself working with folks who, are, uh, who have uh, very clearly defined needs that we're addressing are going to take you to a certain place. And that doesn't mean we're all going to end up in the same discussion. And um, so you, I can sit in room with social workers who do not necessarily see the same political agenda all the time. Mm -hmm. But what is common is that we're really rooted in, in, um, in a client-centered practice of social work. And, and so many people come to the profession because they already have a deep feeling of empathy or compassion, and that may be shaped by a political or, or, a, or a theological, uh, a values-based view of how the world is. Um, mm -hmm. But, but uh, it doesn't require that, you, uh, that we, have a, we have a particular frame here. Mm -hmm. The closer we get to the ground, the more we stay with what's happening with the folks we're talking about the less this is a conflict, I think. The country has a conflict, but uh, we, our, wor our work is to be there for the folks we're serving. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, uh, regardless of political ideology, as long as uh, there's, an, there's an emphasis on how can we serve folks, um, including ourselves. So oftentimes we share identities or we share circumstances with the folks whom we serve. And it's important to remember that as well. Um, as long as we keep that at the, at the base of things, as long as we understand that we are serving the needs of folks and that the idea is that we want to empower, empower individuals, empower communities, and to bring quality, to increase the quality of um, life outcomes for folks, as long as that's the bottom of the line, or that's the bottom line, then uh, we're able to build that empathy that allows us to sort of transcend this this idea of uh, political ideology and move into a space that we're working to empower folks and that we're working with human beings who are perhaps oppressed or are able to achieve the satisfaction of life that they deserve. Okay, so we have a few resources we'd just like to share, and then we'll come back with the rest of our time for more Q&A. So I'm mm -hmm. just going to make this a little bit bigger. So um, to reinforce Nick's point earlier, mental health care workers in the US, the majority of them are social workers. And we're in all sorts of fields. And we do get things done on a micro and macro level, just to reinforce what's been going on in the chat here. Um, Sue asks about sources for more information. And actually, I'm going to show you some of that, too. So um, we've got a lot of policy expertise here at Columbia School of Social Work. Um, somebody asked about the policy minor. And John, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the policy minor or if we should get back to that person. Um, well, uh, there's a policy concentration. And so people come to the school. And in the second year, uh, their focus is not on providing clinical services, but on developing uh, policy methods. Um, and about there are 40 or 50 students in that concentration this year. I just finished teaching the, uh, the, the practice course in the, for, uh, the for third semester of it. So that's a part of who we are. And certainly, you can explore it more on the website. And if you want to talk to me, contact me. Great. Thank you. And I see Natasha is also chiming in about um, policy as well. So maybe she can type in some more info about that. 
And then um, we want to just plug our events. We have recordings. I know somebody had written as one of their uh, role models, David Billings, and he did an event with us, which you can actually see the recording of here at our live stream channel. And our other events are also on our YouTube channel. But please do sign up for more events, because we would love to see you again. And you've been so wonderful and um, engaged here today. And something we haven't talked about here is that the school's got a fairly significant connection with social work in the military. Um, and when you did that event not too long ago. But there are many, many social workers working in various parts of the military. And, uh, and so that's a part of our ongoing discussion about how, how, how we meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in fact, we even have um, special fellowships for folks who want to commit to working in the military. Um, so we do have a reading list, which um, when the slides go out, this will be a part of it. So I'm not going to pause now for that, but wanted to share that that's there. And also want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We really, it's been a, a real pleasure to see everybody here and see how engaged they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to pull up some closing polls, but then we do have time about five more minutes for questions. So um, one question that came up was, um, what about students who want to advocate, but they feel disempowered? What might you say to help them feel uh, the opposite of disempowered? Mm. So I've been working for many years with the Industrial Areas Foundation, which is a national association of community organizing that uh, works with in neighborhoods where many people have feeling like their voice has been taken from them. And we say action, action. Get, go to a meeting. Get yourself out of your house. Meet some people. Get, find your voice and move to action. Uh, because there's no, there's, there isn't a pill, I'm sorry, there isn't a pill, uh, the, it, it really does, uh, it, it is that movement to the fact that, oh, I could go and do that, whatever the next step is, to go and do it. And, mm -hmm. and put yourself around other people that are finding out how to bring themselves to voice um, and, and really allow yourself to believe yourself into, uh, into your voice. Um, one thing I'll add is that if you're feeling disempowered or if you're feeling um, like you don't have the capability or if you feel like you're against an insurmountable obstacle, you're not alone. Um, and it's important to understand that you're not alone in your experience. And there's power in that solidarity and that there's power in connecting with and identifying folks who want the same change or who are feeling the same sort of um, inability to, to make that change. There's power in finding your community. There's power in solidarity even if that power is just identifying with people and feeling like there are others who uh, are experiencing the same things you are. Because once you, once you connect with folks, once you bring in perspectives that, uh, that are not just your own, your ideas are able to expand, your options are able to expand, your responses are able to expand. At the very least, you don't feel like you're alone and you feel like you're able to sort of um, bring empathy to somebody else's experience or somebody else is able to, um, to see you and to hear you and understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. So this is a question I think you'll both like, which is from Sue, who asks, what news sources do you both go to, um, or what do you recommend to get information? New or news? News. News. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one with like the, the fake news uh, tagline that just keeps showing up all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's been helpful to to the idea is instead of just going to one news source to, to explore multiple ones. Um, in the idea that uh, it kind of adds more nuance and more layers to, to issues. Um, but yeah, to, to make sure that um, to folks identify that there are multiple news sources out there and that uh, in doing so, uh, you're able to sort of like uh, add more dimensions to a, to a topic. And I guess that's the best advice I can give at this point until yeah, that's the best advice I can give on that at this point. So um, I, uh, I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day uh, as a sort of baseline of what's happening in the world. Um, and then I have all, I, my email is full of a variety of uh, groups of people that are collecting and bundling news, and I fumble, fumble my way through it. 
Um, and then, honestly, I have three or four or five or six or ten people that I uh, process the news with um, and mm. think about it with to make sense out of it. Um, so, uh, and, but the most important thing is I don't let the news rule my life. Mm. You know, I'm, my work is still my work, and the things that mattered matter whatever apparently is happening in the news today. I had this experience of going to 9-11 right after the, uh, the event and helping. Uh, I actually swept the ash off the street in a couple of major places. It was four inches deep. Um, wow. And and I, I spent the day cooking and serving food to people that were first responders. But I came away and said, the work I was doing in my neighborhood still needed doing. And I was, I was going to keep doing the work I was doing in my neighborhood. And others would have time and make a focus to continue to be downtown. So that was a choice I made at that time. I think that it's kind of staying focused on what really matters to you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we're at 1.59 p.m., so um, I want to make sure we take time to thank our two speakers, John Robertson and Nick Betu. Thank you very much for volunteering all your time for the dress rehearsals and to do this and to answer all these questions. Yes. And yes, thank you. And thank you to our audience as well, and thank you to Mary Leah cox mm -hmm. Um So big thanks. I see some thanks coming in in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. And if folks have any last minute questions, are you going to hang out for a few minutes just to answer any? Yeah, final? Well, I'm, in, I'm in no hurry. I can hang out and we can keep uh, keep chewing away on this. I, 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 I do really like the idea of having some kind of a monthly forum that I've heard run by in the chat and the feedback. I think it's, uh, it, you know, it just, the more we are connected with each other, I'm actually working with someone right now to try and create a, a group of social workers working in criminal justice in New York because mm -hmm. there are there are really hundreds and hundreds of us and we don't know each other, we don't think commonly, we don't have practice standards developed together. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important for social workers to find forums to do this kind of thing together. So thanks mm -hmm. for being with us. I think you've done really important work just by showing up. Mm -hmm. So Fred asks, do you believe that most people will feel more comfortable speaking to a social worker that has experienced the same thing as the client? Mm. It's a tough one that we're trying to answer all the time. Um, I think of, I guess to bring the, the experience of the LGBTQ community again, um, because there has been uh, such a history of marginalization of that group within health and mental health settings, um, uh, discrimination that's perhaps not in, uh, uh, deliberate or un that's not intentional, um, there, is value, there is added value to carrying that experience and carrying that, uh, the dimension of that uh, lived experience and bringing that into uh, letting that inform the way you would approach working with somebody. Um, but since we, we don't have the ability to carry all these identities or to intersect with all these identities at the same time, um, there is a calling on us to, to work as hard as we can to identify where are, where are our blind spots, where are the gaps in our knowledge, uh, and to work as hard as we can to, to fill those gaps because the idea is we're in positions to serve folks, we're in positions to advocate for folks, and we can't do that if we're unintentionally um, causing, uh, re-traumatizing people. We can't do that if we're unintentionally perpetrating, perpetuating oppression that has been, that they have experienced in their lives. The more, the better we can understand that, um, the better we can prepare ourselves to um, work with folks who don't share the same identities that we do. I would say the simple answer to the question is yes. Um, it is, it is uh, always um, helpful if you're working with somebody who's been there and walked with you. Except when that person is thick and doesn't listen to you, and that also can happen. Uh, um, and so the, the social work skills that we all develop hope, and we continue to develop through the rest of our careers is can we really be present and listen to somebody else's experience? And that means we have to be really introspective and honest about our own. We have to make an effort to broaden our experience in our world in as many ways as we possibly can so that uh, people are not strangers to us. 
um, mm. and and that we're humble enough to know that I hate the term cultural competent. I can't become competent in somebody else's culture. I can become mm. sensitive. I can become aware. I can become humble, but I can't become competent in somebody else's culture. Uh, but mm. but I can be present and have had, have had the experience of being present to people. Um, so it's a complex question, Fred, uh, it, 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 there's no kind of this is the only way answer here, but the straight answer is yes, of course. Yeah. And I, I really want to bring emphasis to the, the term uh, cultural humility, um, especially in a position especially in positions in which there are different power dynamics, um, in which there are different um, levels of privilege in play. Um, I think the, the term you brought up, cultural humility, is a beautiful and very um, necessary one. And one of the one of the resources I've actually named is uh, an article about this term called um, critical consciousness, which is a tool by which we can evaluate our own practices, our own approaches, and our own um, responses to analyze them and understand where oppression takes place, where power dynamics sort of uh, influence the 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 outer, the in, I guess the, the, play, the interplay of relationships and dialogues um, in a way that we can, uh, sort of like a framework for um, making sure that we're not perpetuating uh, oppression against groups. So we've got a question from Sustenis Lima who asks, can a clinical social worker shift to a more macro level job in their career even if they focused in school on clinical? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, all the time. You know, uh, people move back and forth. So I know. I know people. Uh, you know, think about doctors. Doctors run hospitals and see clients and the say patients in the same day, right? Um, and and so it's possible for you to have a clinical practice and to be working in a legislative office or to be chairing a, a major task force on an on an issue uh, to to give up your practice for six months and work on a political campaign and then mm -hmm. come back to your practice. We're, we're not, we don't need to be what they call Johnny One Notes in my old, uh, in my old uh, childhood. Um, you know, we, we're, we're multiple people. But the trick is that when I am being a clinical person, I need to give my 100% to that work. And when I am being a, when I'm working on policy, I need to be able to do that. And that there's some development of the use of person that allows me to do two or three things in the same day or the same week or the same year. Um, mm -hmm. And supervision's really helpful for that. You're going to hear Robertson say, a social worker needs a clinical, a supervisor. It doesn't matter where you are. You need somebody who you're talking about your use of person and role and, and goals and, and, and functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also advocate for for opportunities to uh, to look through research and see where there are gaps. Um, and as as it, one of the macro uh, changes that you can make is advocate for more research to be done to fill in those gaps, because that that changes the way the profession handles itself. That changes the way people are served. Um, as supervisors, as as Professor Robertson is saying, you can work with uh, interns. You can work with um, burgeoning social workers or burgeoning practitioners to identify what are their own practices and how can they how can they be mindful of oppression? How can they be mindful of <clears throat> power dynamics? How can they be mindful of what are the questions that they're not asking? Um, and in these ways, we're able to sort of reevaluate our own practice. And when we reevaluate our, our own practice, we change the way um, practice takes place and we change the way the, the, the field of social work is able to um, provide the services that it does. So we had a question a while back now asking about the DACA situation, because that came up in conversation. Could you explain what that is? Go ahead, Nick. Uh, so DACA represents Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and it is a, um, it is a I, believe, I believe, an executive action that was put in place uh, to provide a pathway to citizenship for um, undocumented Americans who uh, arrived here as children who, you know, had no choice in the matter, um, who came here at vulnerable times and have been living in the country um, as Americans and who have been going to school, who have been um, working in the, in the places that they could. Uh, and it's a it's an opportunity. It's sort of a pathway to citizenship for folks who um, want to go to school or who want to join the military um, to uh, it's it's it, like as long as they go through these things and they and they go through this program, 
uh, they're able to have, um, they're able to achieve eligibility, I believe, for residency and then for citizenship. Um, and it also qualifies folks for financial aid money. It, it qualifies folks for um, grants and loans that they can take for where they're going to school. And there are other elements of this that I'm definitely forgetting, but uh, I believe that's sort of the rundown of it that I have. Well, the, 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 the key about the, the dreamers, which is the movement of kids who are, uh, weren't born here but grew up here. And, mm -hmm. um, and for many years, people have been working for a path for citizenship for them. It's failed in Congress a couple of times. And mm -hmm. so President Obama brought forth an executive order that gave, the, gave people in that status working papers and, and, and promised that the administration would not take deportation actions against them so long as they didn't develop criminal records. Mm -hmm. the, this is an administrative and executive order. It's completely dependent upon the president. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the concerns at the moment is that President Trump has expressed a lot of concern about undocumented people in the country. And mm -hmm. there's been, uh, at various times, he said uh, different things about the DACA folks. Most recently, he's been saying that that was not going to be a primary focus of his concern about undocumented people. Uh, but there is, but that the category of deferred action for childhood arrival that President Obama created is is a creation of President Obama and um, and may not uh, be something that President Trump will continue, and that's caused a lot of anxiety because um, people are here. They may have been here since they were two years old, but they are here as an undocumented person, mm -hmm. uh, and um, so. Many of us who know and work with and teach people in that status are thinking and 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 strategizing on how do we uh, how do we support them and how do we bring their story to the administration and the country mm -hmm. in a compelling way that will prevent uh, us from doing things that, from my point of view, we will regret later mm -hmm. as a as a nation. So that actually is a nice transition to another question that came up earlier, which is, what can be done to ensure or enhance the same level of practice, um, of respect for the practice of social work within the next presidential administration? Hmm. So, so I saw that question. And um, I, when I was doing my doctorate work at Columbia, we had a, a, a grand old professor whose name was Al Khan, who anybody who's been around the school for a while would recognize that name. And he told us a story about social work after the election in 1980, um, when uh, the war on poverty efforts had been very much an issue in the election, and the new administration was intending to end the war on poverty activities. And the Columbia University School of Social Work had a deep involvement in the development of the war on poverty, um, and for 20 years had played a significant role in the expansion of it. The school, what the university can, was asking the question of, is social work going to be relevant in this new world? Um, and the school had to ask that question, too. Mm -hmm. And what the school did was return and say, we are doing things that are vital to the well-being of people in the society, whether it's ch children in child welfare or people in so who are experiencing substance abuse or people who are trying to find their way back into employment after disability. Social work is doing things that are vital to the society. Whoever is administering the society is going to need the work that is done by social workers. And mm -hmm. the higher the quality, the more, uh, the more we stand um, with, with credibility and respect about the work that we do, the more our profession will find its own way. So no profession, no election is going to decide that we don't need doctors, and no election is going to decide we don't need teachers, and no election is going to decide we don't need social workers. Um, we may fund medicine differently, we may manage education differently, and we may respond to social need differently. But the people that do it are going to be on the ground doing the work, and also speaking about what they've learned and what they've learned from the people they're working with. Because policymakers 
need the information. Um, I lobbied in the Missouri's legislature for many years, uh, and and uh, the most conservative Republicans would be grateful to see the social work students walk into their office because these were people who had firsthand day-to-day -day experience of what was happening in the lives of people that were important in social in the in the public debate of the time. So I don't. I'm not very worried about our role. I think that as we do our work, it will become clear. That's the Robertson sermon homily on that topic. I accept. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> so we have a question from Rich Lombino, who's an alum and a social work slash artist slash attorney. Um, he is wondering about the um, is Columbia School of Social Work or Columbia in general doing any kind of response to the foreign powers interference in our election, like a class action lawsuit um, since the Electoral College is voting on Monday? Hmm. Well, um, universities are 501c3 corporations and therefore have to, uh, have to sort of, as institutions, uh, not directly engage in, in a political debate like this, but there are people at the law school, there are people on campus, there are people in the, in the social work school who are speaking out about, uh, about the election process. It's a really complex uh, um, issue and uh, I, I, it's certainly an important issue for people to be talking about. Um, and I, I would hope that a, a social worker, performer, lawyer uh, would maybe uh, uh, be saying to, would, be, would maybe be helping us figure out how do we bring this discussion to the public. The sort of deeper issue is that 50% of the country voted in one direction and 50% of the voted the other. It might be 49.5% 49 in one direction and 50.5% 50 in the other direction. And we have to live together in this house. So maybe some social work marriage counselors are needed at the moment. Uh, the concept of a divorce is a little hard to kind of imagine. How are we going to divide the property and, and settle? And and so uh, certainly the integrity of our electoral process is incredibly important and needs to be spoken for if you believe in the democracy at all. Mm -hmm. But there is this other dimension of how do we, how do we live together in this land um, when, when our views about things have divided so badly. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think social workers have a role to play in, in this discussion about living mm -hmm. together as one people. Mm -hmm. here. But um, please, uh, you know, like, uh, give us some some lead on on some directions. I I think that the idea of performance around this that interprets what's happening, there's always a number. You know, there's a there's actually quite a lot of graduates at the um, um, from the school that have equity cards or are performers in various ways and have have performance careers. Um, uh, and uh, you know how do we how do we build that conversation? There also is an NASW working group in California that consults with scriptwriters. Um, and so, how do we formulate and frame issues in such a way that people can hear and understand them? Which is something we all are very grateful for the gifts artists give us about that. Mm -hmm. There's an organization, SAMHSA, um, that actually hosts a sort of like a mental health, a roundup of um, media, of artists, of um, professionals and different um, visible organizations or visible media that uh, that uh, present uh, the, the livelihoods of folks living with mental illnesses in a positive light. And they, they're an excellent, I think they're an ex excellent example of this, of ways in which um, art and advocacy are able to be wed or able to live together in such a way that we can create social change through art and we can create social change and advocacy through through different media. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I actually think we've hit all the questions that came up in chat. Mm. So, um, if you know, there we're welcome uh, we're welcoming more questions in chat and lots of resource sharing and um, contact sharing, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But if we are out of questions, um, big thank you. I see we had almost 100 people stay for this entire post-event um, conversation. So thank you for that. Wow. And yeah. 
I love these um, these takeaways, and we welcome more takeaways and, and feedback. Mm -hmm. But um, Nick, you've been quoted, you are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> And there's uh, there's some more um, requests for monthly forums or future events, mm -hmm. which I think we're all uh, feeling energized about. Something I noticed is that I think towards the beginning, there are some folks who are really interested in applying or still kind of going through that process. Mm -hmm. um, if folks are interested in asking questions, I'm done with finals, so I have a little bit of free time. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> But only temporarily. Um, but I'd be happy to um, to sort of bounce some ideas around if folks are interested in um, asking some questions about the program, application processes, processes, et cetera. I've also seen, um, I think on this, in the chat box, I saw uh, Debbie Lesperance, our director of admissions, who is also an extremely valuable and helpful resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Stephanie Schaefer also, who is Stephanie willing Schaefer. to answer admissions questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and Stephanie is great for the questions for people who don't want to move to New York, but they'd like to do an MSW with us for our online campus. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a good way to direct your questions, Debbie for residential New York and um, Stephanie for online questions. Mm -hmm. And Nick for all the questions? Or <laughs> I guess so. I realize that we have, a, we have an expression called, um, it's not volunteering, it's volunteering, and I think I just did that with... <laughs> <laughs> with with Debbie and Stephanie, but yes, I'd be happy to answer questions as well. Oh, let me put my if should I put my email address out here? I'll just do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Oh, Kim is asking: Are the online classes pre-recorded? No, they're um, they're live like this. So if you're a student in an online class, you can watch the recording later, but they're not public recordings. Well, it's been, it's been great to be with you, and um, uh, um, thanks, uh, Mattia and Mary, Mary, Mary Lou for uh, organizing this. And uh, it's been great to get to know you, Nick, a little bit in this uh, online focus. Oh, and, uh, likewise, Professor Robertson. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I'm around if anybody, if I can be of any use. Take care, oh. all. All right. And Thank thanks you. for uh, officiating, Mattia. It's been it's been very seamless. <laughs> you are a pro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and also, thank you. Uh, our speakers here, or our um, our chat folks here, are sharing the you know the work that they've been doing. And I want to thank them for the amazing work that they've been doing. Like mm -hmm. uh, just as an example, Lashonda Singleton is working on restoration of rights in the mm -hmm. office of the Secretary of the Commonwealth. We had lots of folks who were involved with um, advocacy organizations, um, with schools. So thank you very much for that work on mm -hmm. behalf of you know our community. And as Mary Leah says, happy holidays to everybody, whatever you're celebrating. And happy New Year. That's coming up as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So I guess, uh, I guess that's it. We're going to sign off. And mm -hmm. thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>